Well, you know, on Monday, it was the anniversary of that, of that German guy who posted 95 questions, if you will, <laughs> to, the, to the chapel door um, at uh, Wittenberg. And uh, he, his intention was to reform the Catholic Church. He thought he could change it and fix the problems with it because the, pro- the biggest problems, the problems he had with the Catholic Church were actually rather recent. They were in the last two or three hundred years before Martin Luther's life. Um, but uh, they, the church was not about to give up its power. <laughs> and that's a good thing because what needed to happen was to leave the church. And Martin Luther left the church and established a, a you know, better church, <laughs> um, though Martin Luther had his own problems. And then you had John Calvin, you had Zwingli, and from Zwingli came, uh, came this uh, little group that really liked Zwingli at first because he was sort of in southern Germany, and he, was, uh, he, he, he would not baptize babies, and they really liked that, so they followed Zwingli for a while until he changed his mind. He started baptizing babies. And so this little group called the Anabaptists left Zwingli. And this is the group from which we get the, um, the uh, well, there's, there was a guy named Menno Simmons who uh, founded the Mennonites. And also that's where you would get the Amish from. Well, there was some from this group that influenced um, a, a gentleman, and his name is escaping me now, who then went to England and founded the English Baptists. And that's where we come from. So we're not really Anabaptists, but we kind of come as an offspring from, you know, from the Anabaptist movement that left to the Reformation because they were upset that the Reformation still was baptizing infants. And, and so here we are today, you know. Um, but anyway, all that to say, what about the claims of the Catholic Church? You know, what, what about them? Uh, Let's talk about it uh, for just a minute tonight. We won't take, we certainly won't finish this. We'll just, uh, here's what I'll do. I will convince you, I will give you all the arguments for Catholicism, and then I'll leave you hanging and give you the answers to it next week because I'm going to run out of time. But just know up front, I am 100%, I think all of these arguments are terrible arguments. Just, I'm going to give them to you, all right? Let's, Let's turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16 because... Uh, Matthew chapter 16 is most certainly the passage which um, Catholics will hang the majority of their argument. And of course, you're probably very familiar with it. It says in verse 13, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, meaning son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. All right, so this is the, there we go. I mean, look, Peter was the Pope. And, uh, you know, I mean, do you you see that there? Jesus just said Peter's the Pope. Um, No, you don't see that there. But anyway... Um, one of the things we do see here is the only, unless, unless I'm mistaken, unless I miss something, and that's your job to tell me if I miss something, all right? But um, this is the only place in Scripture where the church is spoken of in a universal sense, where Jesus says, I will build my one single church. And so we want to talk to, tonight about the universal church, and the word universal is um, is the same same word really? It's not doesn't come from the same entomology, but it's, it has the same meaning as the word Catholic. The word Catholic comes from the Greek word katholikos. 
It sounds a lot like Catholic, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but that's the Greek word. It was then translated into Latin and, and then into English, and Catholic is our English word. But it's, the Catholicos just means universal all around the world, right? And so the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, claims that they are the universal church that Christ created. By the way, they're wrong. <laughs> and it's absolute nonsense once you actually think about it. But let me give you, um, first, uh, I'll just say this. The earliest example of someone using this word, katholikos, the Greek word, to describe the church is not in the Bible. In the Bible, we're going to look at a few examples how um, every time the Bible talks about church, the church, it's always talking about a local church, like a local place where there's a church. It's not talking about a universal church, except Matthew 16, where Jesus says, I will build my one church. So we're going to talk about that. Does that mean that there is a universal church? And if, it, if so, exactly what, does, what is a universal church? But to, to get a little bit of frame of reference, one of the great helps in, in understanding what the early Christians, the first century Christians believed, is just comes from a few manuscripts that we have from, from, from Christians like Ignatius, who was the pastor of a church in Antioch, who was um, almost certainly pastor of the church in Antioch. You know, that's where, that's where Paul was sent out from Antioch. And he, was, uh, he died in the uh, very early second century, in the first 10 years of the second century. And uh, almost certainly had become the, church, the, pa- the bishop of the church in Antioch during the time of the apostles. So that means he pro- was probably put there by the apostles. Matter of fact, he was a, he was a disciple of John. So when he writes about what, you know, what they believe on his way to death, right, um, and he writes to churches and they take his, his writings and they copy them. And later on, they, they decided these aren't scripture. The, the, church re- the churches are looking at this and they're saying, oh, we're getting persecuted for having certain books. Which, which ones should we keep even though we're getting persecuted for it? They didn't keep Ignatius's because they knew that he wasn't an apostle. He was, that wasn't scripture. But they did keep his writings as long as they could because they thought what he said was true. So he writes about it, and, but here's how he wrote about it. He says this uh, in his letter to the Smyrnans. This is the first time we see the word Catholicos used um, about the church. It's not in the Bible. It's in, it's in this letter from Ignatius. And it says, Wheresoever the bishop shall appear... There, I mean, the pastor of your church. Let uh, there let the people be, even as where Jesus may uh, may be. There is the universal church. It is not lawful, apart from the bishop, either to baptize or to hold a love feast. But whatsoever he shall approve, this is well pleasing also to God, that everything which ye do may be sure and valid. Uh, Ignatius was really, really. It was a really important thing to him. That all that the churches that he wrote to submitted to their pastor, like their bishop. It was huge. It's the main emphasis of all of his letters, except for two, which we'll look at later because that's really important. That he did not tell the people in Rome to submit to their bishop. Um, anyway, that's a side point. Here he talks about how wherever Christ is, there is the universal church or the Catholic Church. So he's saying every believer in whom is Christ is part of. The universal church, in his opinion. He's not, he's not writing scripture. But in his opinion, as an early Christian, they just thought anyone who's saved is part of this universal sense of a church. Not if, you're, if you joined a certain denomination, right, right? Not if you were following a certain tradition of faith. Or, that was, that was you know, this, wherever Christ is, that's the universal church. That's what he said. So that was certainly not written about in the Bible, and the first Christians didn't think of it that way at all. But here's the argument from the Catholic Church, and sadly, this is probably all that I'll be able to give you. Uh, But the claims of the Roman Catholic Church is that there is a universal church, and that the only church that could be the universal church is the Church of Rome. All right? They, um, there, here's basically there are three arguments. Right? One is that there's times in history when all or almost all Christians 
honored the authority of the church in Rome. So, um, you know, there were dissenters that came and went and disagreed with what Rome was doing for, you know, from about, you know, four or five hundred um, A.D. all the way up to about 1500 A.D. But, you know, for the most part, you have people in, you know, coming and going, but only one that's constant, and that's the, the Roman Catholic Church. So if Jesus is going to build his church, then clearly it must be the Roman Catholic one because all the other ones come and go. Well, that's the argument. It's a silly argument. It makes no sense when you actually think about it. We'll think about it next week. Um, <laughs> then, then they'll say, Jesus made Peter the first pope. And Peter was the bishop in Rome. Well, we'll talk about whether Peter was the bishop in Rome <clears throat> uh, next week. <laughs> uh, but uh, they'll say that Peter, Peter was the first pope. Um, and they'll say that based on Matthew 16, because he says, um, Well, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. They're saying, he, they're literally, he's literally telling Peter, you're in charge of who gets saved, Peter. And you get to say, if people are following you, then they're saved if you want them to be saved. And if you don't want them to be saved, they're not saved. That's complete nonsense. It's completely contrary to the entire gospel. It's total lunacy. But that's the argument, okay? Um, so all of this is, is tough to actually articulate, but not tough to think through and say this is silly, right? Um, so sometimes you're faced with a Roman Catholic apologist and you might stumble over words. But if you ever actually just stop and think about what they're saying, it doesn't make any sense. Um, their argument would be that Peter went to Rome, he was the first bishop of, at the, of the church in Rome, and that he passed on his position in an unbroken line fr from one bishop to the next all the way to the pope we have today, which is historically 100% inaccurate. Yes. It cannot be true, but we'll talk about that next week. Uh, they say also this, that since we are to obey tradition in addition to Scripture, we must have a church tradition to follow. Uh, Second Thessalonians is where they'll go for this. They're sneaky on this one. This one's a sneaky one. All right. Second Thessalonians. This is why they caution you about reading the Bible without their help. <laughs> because you can't come to these conclusions from just reading the Bible. But here's one that they'll, they'll, they'll throw at you. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Um, Paul writes, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. He says, well, listen, he doesn't say just hold on to the scripture. He says, hold on to the traditions you've been taught. I, okay, I can't let this one go. This one's really rather annoys me when, when this is used as an argument because how much of the New Testament was written at the time that Paul wrote this? None. <laughs> this was the first book of the New Testament written. So, of course, he's telling them to hold on to something other than just the Old Testament because that's all they have is the Old Testament and tradition at the time. But that tradition is copied down in Scripture. And by the time Paul dies in 2 Timothy, right before he dies, he tells Timothy, hey, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable. And he says that it's going to make you perfect, thoroughly furnished for every good work. Why? Because it's all done. When Jude writes, he says uh, he was writing um, for them to earnestly contend for the faith, like the body of doctrine, which was once delivered. Meaning, by the time Jude's here, it's already done. There's nothing more to be added. Now, one day and probably not too far in the future, we'll get to actually dealing with specific cult groups. And I would consider the Catholic Church in some respects to fall into a, a kind of a cult group. In some respects. It's not like Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, but a, in, in a lot of ways, um, and at least in certain areas of the world, it can be very cultish, um, and, and it has operated that way. Anyway, so when we deal with some of those groups, we'll, do, we'll talk about all the different problems in the Catholic Church. Not next week. <laughs> but, uh, but next week what we want to do is just deal with this question. Does the Catholic Church have any kind of real claim to this 
universal authority. The, the problem that we have to answer is, um, if there's a universal church, and Jesus said, I will build my church, then where is it? And the Catholic Church will say, well, we're the only ones who've been around all the way since the beginning. Now they haven't, actually. But they'll claim that they have, right? And, well, the Baptist Church certainly hasn't been around since, since Christ. Well, you know, people have held Baptist beliefs throughout history, but the name Baptist has only been around for 500 years, you know? Um, so, well, the Catholic Church goes all the way back to Christ, they'll say. Well, what other church could it be? Um, I think that's, again, nonsense, but we'll talk about why next week. I don't want to go way over time, because if I get into it, we'll just be going forever, all right? Amen. All right. Well, um, last week I convinced all of you to be Catholic, and uh, this week I'll, <laughs> I'll help you not be Catholic. Actually, I, I seriously doubt that I did any such thing. <laughs> but last week we sort of introduced the topic. We've been talking about, of course, the, the doctrine of the church and um, really more specifically last week and this week on the, this idea of the universal church. What does it mean? Um, is, is, is this concept of the universal church a, a true concept? And we went to Matthew 16 uh, which is the really the only place you see the church referred to in a in a singular universal sort of a sense, and uh, we'll read it again to get us started. <clears throat> um, it says this uh, in verse thirteen: When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, "Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am?" And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, after reading these verses, um, a Catholic scholar or theologian would say, how can you not be Catholic? Isn't it so obvious, right? <laughs> Let's break some of these. We'll try to break the verse, these verses down a little bit um, as we talk today. But essentially here, you have Jesus claiming that he's going to build his singular church. And so from this, we get the idea that there is a, a, a um, what some have termed universal church. Um, the word universal is our word, it's the English word. The Greek word would be katholikos, which is the word that's then in, in Latin you know, and, and we, tran we transliterate over to Catholic, right? So when the, Cath the Roman Catholic Church, when you call them the Catholic Church, what you are saying without intentionally saying it is you're saying they are the universal church. Now, I know that's not what we mean. It's just a classification, but that's what they're claiming with that name. They're claiming they are this one church that Jesus founded, right? And we talked about um, the claims of the Catholic Church are basically, there's three argu you know, most popular arguments that you'll hear that, that um, Catholic uh, theologians will use to argue um, for their claim that the, Cath the Roman Catholic Church is the universal church created by Jesus. And they basically go like this. The first one would be, well, there were times in history when... There were, you know, the only um, uh, authority that almost all or all Christians honored the authority of the Roman Church, of the Church of Rome. And they, they looked to the Church of Rome as an authority on matters, and they can track a looking to the Church of Rome as an authority, they can track that back to about the second, really more, more commonly the third century um, and so they'll say well this 
obviously existed ever since Christ. And so um, if, if there is a church that, that Christ created, that Christ founded, it has to be the Catholic Church. I mean, there were dissenters to the, to the Roman Church, but uh, to the authority of the Roman Church, but they came and they went, and none of them formed a denomination. So if you're going to look for a denomination that is the church that Jesus built, it has to be the Roman Catholic Church. That's one of their arguments. Um, it's completely fallacious. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, Jesus, uh, the other argument would be that Jesus made Peter the first pope. And we just read where he made him the first pope. He said, if I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So obviously Peter had the authority to let people in to heaven or to say you can't go to heaven. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. It makes me laugh a little bit because it's just, well, it's nonsense based on everything else we know in scripture. But, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to talk about that. Um, but their line of reasoning goes that since Peter died in Rome, he would have passed his position on to someone else in Rome. And so the bishop of Rome would then be the authority, would receive the authority of the keys of heaven, and then he would give it to someone else. And even though we don't see any bishops in Rome, and we don't know who the bishops in Rome were um, through history, we can just kind of guess that it was passed along through bishops in Rome, uh, all the way until you, we actually have historical documentation of bishops in Rome, at, again, at the end of the second or the third, or in, in the third centuries. Um, and that would be their argument. Then the third line of argument is from 2 Thessalonians 2.15. And, and I, I hesitate to say which of these is stronger because I feel like none of them are. Um, but uh, 2 Thessalonians would be, um, be another angle they would take. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, we read this last week, where it says, <clears throat> Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So Paul is telling uh, the, the Thessalonian church to hold to traditions. Well, how do we know what the traditions of the church are? This is clearly outside of Scripture, they would say. So these are traditions that aren't found in Scripture. They're extra-biblical things. Well, how do we know what they are? Obviously, we're supposed to hold to them, and we would only know them if they're passed along through a church. Um, so obviously, you have to have a church that's passing along traditions outside of the Bible. And so, yeah, you find a lot of things in the Catholic Church that aren't in the Bible, but that's because they were traditions. And Paul told us to hold to the traditions, see? You see how <laughs> you're all shaking your heads. That's good. That's a good sign that you're not buying this, okay? That's great. That's, that's wonderful. I'm glad to see that. But that's, that's basically the argument, okay? Let's, let's kind of break these down and talk about it. Here's some errors in these claims that, that really break them apart. Um, first, we'll deal with the claim that, they, that, that there has to be this one physical denomination on the earth that Jesus was creating. When he said, um, I will build my church, was he creating a physical, visible denomination, right? A set of tradition. You know, um, is that what he was creating? Because literally every other time the word church is used in the Bible, it's talking about an assembly of people, people who assemble together in a specific place. Because that's what the word church means, <laughs> assembly, right? So Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my assembly. This is the word he uses. So he's... When, when is who he's talking about going to assemble? Well, they're not going to assemble until the end, right? When he gathers up his church and then they assemble together, right? So he's built, when he talks about building his church, he's talking about everyone who's going to assemble together around his throne one day, right? When he talks about the church, he's not talking about one denomination, right? He's not talking about you know, people who are doing things based on a certain tradition. He's talking about those who are genuinely part of his sheep, those who are generally part of genuinely believers, right? So when he talks about his church, 
The Roman Catholics have to make that a physical, visible thing on the earth, but that certainly wasn't what Jesus was talking about because you can't all meet together as one assembly on the earth. Right? Not even the Catholic Church can all assemble together all at the same time. You just can't do that, right? So he wasn't talking about a universal in, sense, in the sense of all around the world, this is the church. He's talking about all around the world and all throughout time, we're all part of this future assembly that will assemble together around the throne of God. Um, this clearly is what Jesus is talking about. It just seems very obvious if you were in the first century and you heard him use the word ecclesia, you'd know he means, oh, well, at some time we're all going to assemble, right, together. He's not talking about, um, you know, a, a denomination or a physical on the earth reality, but rather something that's going to happen in the future. And we also know this. We, I read this last, last week, but here's a quote from, again, another a great, great way to defeat um, Catholic theology is to go back into the early f- second century where we have writings from Christians during the time and they had no idea of any of the things the Catholics claim had to exist from Peter on. And here's a guy named Ignatius. Now, Ignatius thought he was pretty important in the church. I don't know why he wasn't the bishop of Rome. He was the bishop of Antioch. And on his way to die, he writes a bunch of letters telling people what to do after he's gone. Well, Antioch was an important church to the apostles, but remember, Peter had already died, so he'd already passed his, his you know, popeship onto the bishop of Rome, right? Well, not, that's not how Ignatius thought. Ignatius actually writes a letter to the church in Rome, and he tells them what to do. Well, how, who's Ignatius to tell Rome what to do, right? If, if the authority of Jesus Christ passed on to the Bishop of Rome. And by the way, in every single letter that Ignatius writes, he writes to, to the churches and he says, you guys, in, to the church in the, of the Magnesians, you guys better submit to your bishop. Uh, to every single church he writes to, the Church of Philadelphia, you better submit to your bishop. You better submit to your bishop. You're, it's, it's you guys under the bishop, under the Lord. If you want to obey the Lord, you got to obey the bishop. He's not saying submit to Rome. He says, there's God, there's your pastor, and then there's you. <laughs> like, follow that order. He doesn't say there's another church involved. Um, and when, even though every church he writes to, he talks about the bishop, he writes to the church in Rome and never mentions a bishop one time because they didn't have a bishop. They probably had multiple elders who made decisions for their church instead of a singular pastor. You say, well, no, but there has to be one pastor over every church. That's just not how they did it back then. Now, most churches had one guy who was over the whole church, and they had you know, deacons, kind of like we But there were some churches that didn't, and that's perfectly fine. God never said that was not okay, right? Um, so, interestingly enough, the... From what we can see from the letters of Ignatius, the early Roman church did not have a bishop after Peter died. They didn't have one guy who was in charge. And they certainly weren't seen as the authority over the other churches after Peter died. But here's something that Ignatius wrote. He said this. um, uh, This is to the church of the Smyrnaeans. He said, Wheresoever the bishop shall appear, there let the people be, even as where Jesus may be, There is the universal church. And he uses the word Catholic there because it's Greek. It's a Greek word. And he said, wherever Jesus is, that's the universal church. That's part of the universal church. Why? Because every believer has Christ in them and are therefore part of the universal church. Not everyone who's, you know, following the church of Rome and is submitting to the pope and is worshiping Mary, and you know, <laughs> that is not what he says. In, in the mind of the people of the second century, this idea of Catholic just meant, oh yeah, the, the, everybody who's saved is part of Christ's church that will eventually be an assembly together before Christ. And so this idea that the Catholics have that, oh, that's us, that has to be the de- denomination of the Roman Catholic Church, it's just nonsense. It's just not in Scripture. It's clearly not implied. Um, there is not one case 
um, uh, uh, this is not the case. The apostles always referred to, ch to churches as local churches. Uh, let me show you a, a few examples of this. Every other place the word church is used is going to refer to a local body. And this is because it's all referred to by apostles who are referring to people right now. Jesus was referring to people in the future, his church that will eventually assemble. Every other time it's used, it's talking about people now, and there's not one church now. There's churches. There's church assemblies of people in different places. We haven't all assembled. We don't all assemble together. Um, 1 Corinthians 6.19 is a good example of this. Let's go there. <clears throat> I try to get there fast so that there's not a lot of dead time. But then, then people complain because I'm getting there too fast, so I'll slow down. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What know you not that your body, that is your... Um, you remember when we're reading the Old English, we're talking about the... When we read a you, you or a your, that's a plural, right? It would be thy body if it's a singular right your body meaning the church body of Cor corinth the church know you not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and ye are not your own so their body but he says your body like you have a church body that assembles now, he also goes on to say, individually they're filled with the Holy Ghost, for ye are bought with a price, uh, therefore glorify God in your spirit, uh, in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. Ye are bought with a price, um, and it says, uh, your body, plural, that, that's talking about the church, is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, that's all of you collectively, as you assemble, remember, the Holy Spirit's in you, which ye, that's singular, have of God. So each individual person in the church has the Holy Spirit, and as an assembly, we're, we're just a temple of the Holy Ghost when we come together. That's pretty, pretty neat, the ye and the your, the plurals there. But he's talking about an individual assembly. <clears throat> um, how about uh, 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians... Uh, 11. Second Corinthians 11 and verse 28. <clears throat> Paul is talking about um, how, uh, how the, the work and the weariness and painfulness that he goes through. And he says, verse 28, Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches. Now, he says all, so he's talking about every single one. So he could, be, he could just say, the care of the universal church. But here's the problem. Since Jesus found, started the church, people have died, which means Paul cannot possibly care for all the universal church. It's not all on the earth anymore, right? <laughs> and plus, some of it doesn't exist yet, like you and me, right? It's all one thing. <laughs> and uh, so he says, all the churches, because individual local assemblies, all of the assemblies, which eventually will all be one assembly, right? Um, and then we'll come back here in a minute. That's an interesting statement by Paul, because he's caring for all the churches. Wouldn't you think that was Peter, you know, the Pope? Wouldn't he be caring for all the churches? But no, this is Paul. Um, 1 Peter 5, just, just a few examples. This will be our last one. But when you, ever you he, see the apostles talking about a church, using the word church, they're always talking about a local church. 1 Peter 5, verse 13. <clears throat> this, by the way, is Peter almost definitely writing from Rome before he dies. Now, we don't know for sure that Peter did die in Rome. We don't know that 100% sure. But this is the verse where we think that we have evidence for that. And here's what it says. Uh, he's signing off, First Peter, and he says, verse 13, the church that is at Babylon, 
elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Here Peter is talking about Babylon, and of course, just like we see in the book of Revelation, Babylon is also is often what they use to refer to Rome. We see that in, in Revelation 17 and 18, right? Um, so Peter's signing off, probably from Rome, when he says this, because Babylon wasn't really a city back then. Um, I mean, I, I suppose it, there was probably something near Babylon that he could be referring to, but most likely this is from Rome, and he says, the church that is at Babylon. You know, here's this church that's here. Now, if he's in Rome, and he's the bishop of Rome, he's the pope, then why would he say the church that is at Babylon? He should say, the universal church salutes you, right? The Catholic church. But he doesn't say that, right? He says, this church that's at Babylon wants to salute you. And, uh, and, uh, and so we have here potentially evidence that, that Peter was in Rome and died there. We certainly don't have any evidence that he thought of the church as a, as a universal on the earth right now, you know, visible thing. Rather, they were individual churches. Um, so there's, there's that. The word church means assembly, so that's the obvious thing. Jesus was clearly referring to the final assembly of his sheep around the throne of God in heaven. Remember in John chapter 10 where he says, you know, I have these sheep and then I have other sheep that are not here yet. Remember in John 17 where he says, Lord, I'm not just praying for them. I'm also praying for everyone who's going to believe on them through thy word. So when he says, I'm going to build my church, he's thinking about all the ages from then all the way until the, they assemble together and are a assembly, a church, right? Now, we can refer to this. It's not wrong for us to say, oh, the church is going to be raptured, the church, right? But when we do, we should really be using the type of terminology that Jesus is. When we're talking about future things, when we will future assemble, then we can refer to ourselves as the church. But when we're talking about right now, and we say, well, the church in America, the, okay, all right, but you're, remember, you're just talking about the church that's alive right now in America, because there's a lot of the church from America that isn't alive right now. Either they haven't been born yet, or they already died, right? So remember that the, the church is, is an all-encompassing term that Jesus used to talk about the entire thing from beginning to end. Um, so, interesting. All right, <clears throat> so there's... No scripture te scriptural teaching that one denominational tradition would be the universal church, and it doesn't fit with the idea at all. So that whole claim, bogus. All three of them are bogus, but that one definitely, all right? If, uh, then here's another, here's another point I, I, I wrote down, I jotted down here. If, as early Christians like Ignatius used the, tr used the term universal church to refer to all... Um, uh, all saved people in whom is Christ, then the Catholic Church, arg the Catholic argument, or the, the Roman Catholic argument, that the, their specific Christian tradition and authority constitutes the universal church is just nonsense. It doesn't fit with what people, even u the original users of the word Catholic Church, meant. Um, all right, so that one's out. Let's talk about Peter being the first pope. Got a little time here. We'll, we'll squeeze in, and, and we probably won't get to the last claim about tradition, but that'll be a fun thing to get into, sola scriptura and all that next week. All right, so did Jesus make Peter the Pope in Matthew 16? Well, he was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Does he say that? I mean, does he actually say that Peter himself was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Well, let's go to Matthew 16. It says, <clears throat> And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, verse 19. But he also, in verse 18, says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, is he saying he's going to build his church on Peter? Well, there's multiple ways you could, you could interpret this verse. Peter means sort of a little stone or a little pebble, and that's why Jesus named him Peter, um, which is kind of, you know, if he wasn't Jesus, you'd probably be offended. Wait, my name's Simon. No, 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 you're a little pebble. That's what you are, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thanks, Jesus. Um, but Jesus is, is actually saying to, he's belittling Peter here. He says, 
you're blessed, Peter. Like, this is not from you. He says, flesh and blood hasn't revealed it to you. You're just the son of Jonah. Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah. Because your flesh and blood didn't give you this. This isn't because you're a Jew or because you're something special, Peter. This is some, this understanding that Jesus is the Christ comes from God. And he says, um, so you're blessed. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it unto you. And I say unto you, unto, unto you that you are little, a, a little pebble. And on this rock, I will build my church. There's really kind of two ways that you can fairly, there's a lot of ways you can interpret it. But there's only two ways you could probably fairly interpret it. Either Jesus is giving a contrast here between Peter, the little pebble, and then the real rock isn't Peter. Because he's just said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this unto you. You're nothing special, Peter. I'm going to build my church on the real rock. And what would the real rock be? Well, who he is. Because what had he just asked Peter? Who do men say that I am, but who am I? You're Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. He says, you're just Peter. I'm going to build my church on the rock. There's another way that you could interpret it that's actually fair. I, I would probably say it works, and, may, and it's possible Jesus meant both, right? Um, he could also be saying, you, as one of the 12, uh, who are, interestingly enough, in Revelation, the, the 12 foundation stones of the New Jerusalem, right? He might be saying, you guys are the beginning of my church. I'm going to build a church on you. Not, not, like, not like you're you know, anything special. He's literally just said, you're nothing special, but you're the beginning of my church. This is pretty cool. But you're not worthy to be the beginning of the church because you're just a little pebble, Peter. That's why you need me, who's the rock, right? So it, it might be that he's meaning both of those senses. See, I'm building it on me, but you guys are the beginning of it. Can you believe that? Um, that doesn't seem right. Both of those kind of work really well as an interpretation. But what doesn't work as an interpretation is, Peter, you know what? Because you're so special and you figured this out, even though it wasn't you who figured this out and you're blessed, I'm going to actually just build an entire church on you, Peter. You're in charge now, right? You are, you hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven, Peter, and if you want to deny someone heaven, then they can't go to heaven. You know why we, d we know that that's not what Jesus was saying? Look with me at Matthew 18. Two chapters later, um, we don't know how much time, but it wasn't much time. Look what it says in verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, What's wrong with you, disciples? He just said Peter's the Pope, okay? He said that if you offend Peter, he can keep you out of heaven. Well, what do you mean who's the greatest? It's obviously Peter. That's not what the disciples thought. None of them thought that Jesus had just made Peter in charge. Zero disciples thought that. Uh, not even Peter. So clearly, that was not what Jesus was conveying to them. Now, Peter was the one that was going to be used of God to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and up until that point, the church has sort of not given the gospel to the Gentiles. And so you have him sort of carrying the keys, meaning the gospel, to those who were rejected from receiving the gospel and opening that door for them, right? Um, so in that, it seems very obvious that that's the sense in which Jesus was saying it. It was a prophecy about something Peter would be used of God to do, not some power that he had to use whenever he wanted, you know? And so um, let's look at just a few more verses in closing um, about the apostles. Maybe the, maybe the apostles were just mistaken. Maybe later they figured out that Peter's in charge, right? Um, go with me to Acts chapter 17. This is after Jesus ascends into heaven. The church is filled with the Spirit. They're going, right? I mean, I don't care when you say the church started. They're started by Acts 17, okay? Um, and clearly... Um, you know, Peter is out there acting as the Pope, right? Well, they all have this conversation about what to do about the Gentiles. Because Gentiles are getting saved, and of course they weren't ever given the law of God like the Jews were, and so should they be made to follow the law of God? And if not, how can they associate with Jews who are, who are unclean being around the Gentiles? What are we going to do about this? And so they all meet together to, to talk about this. 
And uh, when they meet, the first person that, that's recorded as speaking um, is Paul and, uh, and, and Peter. Well, you've got two people who sort of testify. Um, <clears throat> Acts chapter 17. Uh, let's skip down to... I'm, I'm sorry, it's not Acts uh, 17, it's Acts 15. I'm sorry. Wrote down 17, because 17 is another good chapter of Acts. It just has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, <clears throat> verse 6 of, of chapter 15. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how I'm the Pope. And I get to say what's going to happen here, right? And no, that's not Peter. Peter actually just shares his testimony of how God used him to reach a Gentile. So it, it sort of sets, sets the, st- the, the tone that Gentiles are genuine Christians, right? Um, and they had, didn't need to um, repent of eating pig before they were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, verse 9, that he says that they put no difference and all that. Well, now Peter's spoken, so obviously... Everyone says, oh, obviously we know Peter is the Pope, he's in charge, let's, let's stop, the, the conversation's over. Um, verse 12, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. What do I need to hear them for? Well, Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul were out there winning Gentiles to Christ. So Barnabas and Paul were more authoritative on this matter. So when they finished with Peter, they went to talk to Barnabas and Paul. And you know, when they finished with Barnabas and Paul, um, then you have Peter gets up and gives the conclusion of what, uh, what they decide. It says this in verse 13, And after they had held their peace, James... Wait a minute. Oh, I, I must... Am I in the right passage of Scripture? James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me, not unto Peter. <laughs> Simon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets, as it... As it is written, after this I will return. Um, Verse 19, we'll skip down. Wherefore my sentence is, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. And he goes on. And they all agree to James's conclusion. Well, well, who is the Pope? Is it James or is it Peter? (laughs) And actually, if you go to the book of Galatians, you find this really... Now, you know this, Brother Tim, because you're, uh, you're studying the book of Galatians right now. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, look at this, Um, it says that, um, verse uh, verse 1, then 14 years, this is Paul writing, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave not place nor subjection. Um, and let's skip down to verse 8, uh, verse, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. Nothing different between Paul and Peter as far as Paul's concerned. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace, uh, perceived the grace that was uh, unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and, and they unto the circumcision. Only that we, would, we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before the, that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, he, uh, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So Paul is writing Holy Scripture here under the inspiration of, of God, claiming that he was right to tell the Pope, you are wrong, <laughs> And withstand him to, the, to his face. And guess what? The Pope, the Pope with air quotes, if you're just listening online and not looking, the Pope with air quotes didn't have a problem with it. Um, 
Uh, of course, Paul is, the, is a better candidate for Pope. He said all the, he had the care of all the churches. And uh, Peter says this about Paul later. Now, you, you might say, well, obviously Paul was out of line. He, he was wrong, right? Okay, well, look at what Peter said about Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 15. He says, uh, And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, now watch this phrase, as they do also the other scriptures. Peter, who I'm sure by now has read the book of Galatians, was one of the first books of the Bible, maybe the first book of the New Testament written. Um, he's probably read the book of Galatians by now. He's referring to Paul as a beloved brother and to his words his writing, his epistles, as scripture. Because when people wrestle with it, it's like when they wrestle with the other scriptures. So Peter is saying that it is scripture when Paul withstands the Pope to his face. This makes no sense. This does not work. There is no sane universe where you can come to the conclusion that Peter was the first Pope. And Peter even says, so look at what Peter, how Peter describes his position in 1 Peter 5, he says, The Pope unto, no, he says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a, part of a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He says, hey, all the elders that are at the church, he's writing to, to the Jews right now, he's, all the elders that are at the church, um, I'm going to exhort you, and this is coming from just a fellow elder. He's not saying this is coming from the, the authority who's telling you, no, this is coming, I speak from in the position of Christ. No, he's saying I'm just another elder, you know. Peter may have wanted to vaunt his position before, um, before um, the Holy Spirit and, and the change that was wrought in his life, but he clearly didn't think of himself as the Pope. He clearly didn't think of himself as authority. The other apostles clearly didn't think so. The rest of the church clearly didn't think so. He may have died in Rome, but that doesn't make mean that he thought he was the Pope and that, that was passed on. Now, Rome was a big area, a big place. And later on, a couple hundred years after this, it is true that there was, if, if somebody, one little church out in the middle of nowhere came across a, a heretical group that came to their, their neighborhood and started teaching false doctrine, they would often write to big cities where there are churches and ask them if they'd come across this heresy. Rome was the crossroads of the world. So you do see a couple hundred years later where churches will write to the church in Rome and say, hey, can you help us with this heresy? You know, what are your thoughts? They weren't saying you guys are the authority and... Peter is the authority over us, um, but it morphed into that over time, and of course that was not biblical. It just certainly wasn't the way that, it, that, that, that Christ meant it to be. Um, but that doesn't mean that Peter established it, that Jesus made Peter the Pope. All of that's nonsense. We'll talk next week about the, the idea of tradition. Is there something outside of the Bible that we should also accept as authority, right? And um, the Catholic Church will even say, listen, you wouldn't even know what is the Bible if it wasn't for us telling you what it is. Um, they're wrong, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll talk about that next week. Okay, very good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness, and thank you that we can be part of your church. Now, what a privilege it is to be a part of this church, and also to know that we're part of the assembly that will meet around your throne, and there's those who have gone on before, and some who aren't even alive yet, that we expect we'll meet there. And what a wonderful, wonderful reunion that will be um, as your church uh, assembled together all at the same time for the first time. And uh, we look forward to seeing Peter and Paul and talking about these 
uh, silly nonsense uh, things that are said about them by uh, heretical groups like the Catholic Church. Lord, we pray for those in the Catholic Church that we be able to reach them. There, some of them are sincere and sincerely love you, but are sincerely deceived. We pray that we'd be able to help them and reach them. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, and we pray that you'd bless us as we go from here. In Jesus' name.